August 28, 1962, San Jose, California. Loud Italian opera music is playing in an elegant apartment alongside with muffled screams of a woman in pain. Even though the neighbors could clearly hear the commotion, they did not call the police. No. Instead, a successful doctor and devoted husband, Kaplan Kesa did. The same man who was responsible for pouring acid onto his wife's face and genitals. Kaplan Giza was born on the 27th of June 1926 in the small town of Mako in southern Hungary. He was coming from a rich, noble and aristocratic family, but despite his upbringing, his father subjected him and his siblings to very severe physical abuse. After one particularly brutal beating, he even lost a sight in one eye. But life went on for him and he graduated with honors as a cardiologist from the University of Szeged in 1951, though only five years later, in 56, after the failed Hungarian revolution against the Soviet oppression, he, just like thousands of other Hungarians, fled the country in the hopes of a better future abroad. He first went to Denmark, then to England, and finally came to the USA. There he had to retrain as an anesthesiologist at the University of Harvard because his Hungarian degree was not recognized there, and for a brief period of time he even taught classes at Yale, before finally settling in San Jose, California. There he began practicing as an anesthesiologist at the local hospital, and he was very successful in his career, but not so much in his love life because of his unattractive looks. He had a huge round forehead, he had unflattering glasses, and he was skinny and weak looking. Despite his unattractive looks, he still had a certain kind of charm to him, so he still had girlfriends here and there, but it wasn't until June 1962 that he finally met the woman that he thought was going to be the one. It was an outstandingly beautiful blonde bombshell and a former beauty queen, the 25-year-old Pilar Heine. At the time, she worked as a showgirl at Bimbo 365, which is a nightclub, and she was also a fashion model there in San Francisco. But besides that, she was also the daughter of a two times Olympic champion fencer. Similarly to Giza, she also fled Hungary to the USA in the hopes of a better future. After the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, her father went to the USA and there she and her mom met up with him and reunited as a family but sadly her dad died shortly after. Heine's mom was out of this world excited, head over heels, when she learned that Heine was proposed to by this rich, aristocratic, successful doctor, Giza. And Heine really didn't like or love Giza in the slightest. He was in love with another Hungarian man, an engineer, and she wanted to marry this other guy. But because she wanted to appeal to her mom, in the end she agreed to marry Geza, despite her emotions really not being all there at all. In August, so only two months after they first met, the two got married. And as you already know, Heine really wasn't there emotionally. She didn't fancy Geza in any way and she really wanted to keep in touch with her previous boyfriend. And rumor has it, or at least based on the information of Mrs. Haidu, who was the couple's acquaintance, Heine had a secret love affair going on from before the wedding and it lasted well into her new marriage. And Mrs. Haidu told this to Geza, who became furious he flew into a jealous rage and he came up with a vile plan to take revenge on Heine for her supposed infidelity. 
His goal was to make her as ugly as possible so that no other man could ever lay eyes on her ever again. On the 28th of August, so just a couple of weeks into their marriage, Geza carried out his evil plan to punish Heine for her supposed infidelity. And here is your warning, you may want to skip this if you don't want to hear the details. He tied her to the sofa, put on loud music to mask her screams, and then took out a medical scalpel and cut her body countless times, making countless scars on her body. He then poured a mixture of hydrochloric, sulfuric and nitric acid into her gaping wounds. Heine's body was 60% covered in third-degree chemical burns. Her face and her genitals became completely disfigured and unrecognizable. And he left her there to suffer for three hours before he decided to call the police to give himself up. When the police entered the apartment, they saw something that nobody should ever have to see and something that no one can ever forget. Him just sitting there calmly on the sofa to which his wife was tied while she was laying on the ground and her body covered in gaping wounds and acid burns in agony, but she was still alive. Luckily, she was able to recover enough to give her statement to the police about what happened to her, but sadly, she lost the battle for her life only a few days later and she died on the 30th of September. The investigation didn't last very long because they had Heine's testimony and Giza's confession with all of the evidence in the room. So the trial started five months later on the 9th of January 1963. He was first charged with attempted murder but it was later changed to murder by torture when Heine succumbed to her injuries. And the same witness who tipped Geza off, Mrs. Haidu, gave her testimony on court and Geza pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. And this part of this case is really unbelievable. I don't think I've ever heard of anything quite like this from a real life example. Giza's behavior during the trial was bizarre to say the least. First of all, he didn't take off his sunglasses the whole time in the courtroom. And on the first day of the trial, he didn't say anything and he didn't even do as much as fidgeting in his chair. He sat there completely motionless for hours. On the second day though, when the persecutor was showing the photos of Heine's mutilated body, he jerked up from his chair and he started yelling in this weird panicked frenzy, no, no, what have you done? What did you do to her? And he was so out of it that he had to be forced back into his seat. Now, his reason for his insanity plea was kind of like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of a plot. He claimed to suffer from a very severe case of multiple personality disorder. On most days, he was his true self, Giza, the young, loving, successful doctor. But on other days, he had this dark, evil alter ego. And this alter ego was a French journalist named Pierre Laroche. And he blamed a lot of his crimes on this Pierre guy. For example, in 1954, when he still worked at a hospital in Hungary, he fell in love with and started a love affair with one of his patients, which goes against his Hippocratic Oath. The French journalist had no problem with having a love affair with a patient, but whenever he was Geza, he was himself, he was very ashamed of breaking his oath. And there was another similar accident in 1959 when he worked in a Boston hospital, when he met, impregnated, cheated on and abandoned his female patient. 
he didn't even know that he was doing this because it wasn't Geza doing it, it was Pierre doing this. So he didn't know about this whole thing until one day he arrived to the hospital as Geza and he was confronted by this female patient for having ghosted her. But there are some holes in this story of him having multiple personalities. He said that he first met or he first became aware of his other alter ego, Pierre, in 1957 while admiring the painting of the Mona Lisa in Paris. And suddenly, all of a sudden, he turned into this other person. He was Pierre, the sexy, big talker, confident, macho guy. And that was the first time he supposedly became Pierre. But then how could he have this patient who he had a love affair with in 1954, so three years earlier? I don't know anything about multiple personalities, but I don't know how that adds up, if there is an explanation to that. But my opinion really doesn't matter because the team of forensic psychologists who worked on his case all said that this was just a story. He just came up with this to get away with murder and the jury couldn't be convinced about it either. It was clear, yes, that Giza must have suffered from some kind of a mental illness to be able to do what he had done, and they speculated that maybe he had paranoid schizophrenia as a result of his childhood abuse. But it is very important to note that just because somebody has a mental illness of any sort or of any severity, it doesn't mean that they are a murderer or a criminal, we really should stop this stigma that they are more likely to do something like this because they are not. But it is very important to say that even if Giza had any kind of mental condition, it still would not justify what he had done. He did something very brutal that I believe only truly evil people are capable of doing. Anyway, the jury was made up of 10 men and 2 women and they deliberated for over 20 hours trying to decide if he deserved the death penalty or life in prison. And in the end they gave him life in prison because they considered his possible mental illness. But the judge also included in the court file that nobody was to ever let him free without seeing the photographs of Heine's mutilated body, without seeing the kind of monstrosity that this man was capable of doing. Sadly, at that time there was no real life sentence in California and after only seven years a convicted murderer could be let out on parole. And this is how it happened that Giza was able to get out of prison early without serving an actual life sentence. He was successful at his second attempt to get parole, so he was let free after only 12 years. Not only was he let out of prison on parole, he was also flown out to Taiwan to work as a doctor in a Catholic mission as part of his rehabilitation program. Now obviously this caused a huge public outrage. This man served only 12 years in prison for false imprisonment, torture, mutilation and murder and he was now living his best life in Taiwan where he even remarried. Giza said that he was going to dedicate the rest of his life, no matter how long or how short, to helping the poor in developing countries. But this lifelong commitment really only lasted four years when he illegally fled Taiwan, breaking his parole, as one could expect. And this man was now on the loose. These rehabilitation program attempts in the last century in the US caused a lot of brutal murderers to just escape when no one was watching. And Giza really was not the first one to take advantage of the goodwill of people. But now he was a wanted man and he was even put on the Interpost list. The next time he was cited was in 1980 in Germany, when a local newspaper published an article about famous brutal murders, including Heine's. 
and that was when his colleagues at the hospital where he was working at recognized him from the photos. So they fired him immediately. That's not what they should have done. They should have called the police, but instead they just fired him and now he had his chance to escape again. We know that in 1983 he worked at the US Army Health Clinic in Bavaria, but other than these two known sightings, he may have had even more chances to escape. Maybe the police had even more opportunities to catch him, but they somehow never did. They always failed to track him down. And Giza went on to live his life under the radar for the next 19 years, all the way until 2002, when just in a couple of months, some regular journalists were able to track him down, something that the police couldn't do for decades. And he lived in this tiny German town called Bad Swishanan with his wife that he met back in Taiwan. And he didn't even try to conceal his identity. His real name was written on his door. And how could this be? How come this guy is not trying to conceal who he really is? Like, how can he live his life so publicly? Well, two years before the journalist tracked him down, he obtained German naturalization. And now as a citizen, Germany didn't have to extradite him to the USA. So he had nothing to fear. When the journalist knocked on his door, a 70-something year old fit-looking Giza opened the door. And he asked the journalist not to bring his story into his town because he didn't want his life to be ruined and he didn't want to have to move somewhere else and build up another reputation again. He said that I made one big mistake in my life and I paid greatly for it. Excuse me, I don't think that the deliberate torturing and murdering of your wife is a mistake. That's not the word that I would use in such context. And spending only 12 years in prison for something like what he did is not a great price to pay for it anyway. But since 2002, we don't know what's going on with him. If he's still alive, then he is 96 years old. He got away with murder, pretty much. And this is 100% the justice system's fault. People get locked up for life for non-violent petty crimes. And people like Giza are walking the streets freely under protection from the government after having tortured and brutally murdered someone who definitely didn't deserve it. It is almost debilitating to know that Giza only had to spend 12 years in prison so that now he can live his life freely in his cute little German town and that his biggest problem in life is that his reputation could be tarnished if the truth was out and that his wife may or may not have cheated on him and Heine had to pay with her life for the cruelty of this woman. And I'm so sorry that she had to endure all that excruciating torture that he imposed on her. This is a very sad case and it's so depressing to know that people like him exist and that they are living freely and this could happen to any one of us. But he also had a book written about him in 1965. I'm gonna link it in the description. But thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to share your thoughts about this case in the comment section and to like this video and also you may as well subscribe because I have videos like this coming every week. Thank you so much for being here and I see you next time. Bye.